So let's look at the story of Jesus a little more. I want to read a few texts this morning to sort of set the stage. First, I want to read from Mark 12, 28 through 29 uh, again. And we've heard part of it in our songs this morning, which was lovely. Thank you, Andres and worship team. Mark 12, 28. And if you would, would you stand with me one more time? If you're able to do so, stand up and give your neighbor a hand if you need to. And uh, we're going to read this text together. Very short, and then I'm going to read a little bit from Thessalonians and Corinthians as well. So Jesus is addressing uh, those that are around him, the religious leaders of the day in Israel. He says, now one of the experts in the law, one of the religious lawyers, as it were, speaking of which, that could have been one of my career paths, but thank God we didn't go down that one. Now, (laughs) no offense for those that are lawyers, by the way, Uh, just for me, it would have been very bad. Now, one of them, the experts in the law, came and heard them debating, and when he saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, and this is a loaded question, by the way, which commandment is the most important of all? They weren't supposed to rank the commandments. But Jesus, fully human, fully divine, takes the bait and answers this way. Jesus answered, the most important is this, the Shema, quoting from Deuteronomy 6.4, listen, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second, verse 31, is love your neighbor as yourself. So it combines two pieces of law. For there is no other commandment greater than these. Now we're going to read another passage here. I'm going to turn just a moment. I marked it so I can go there quickly. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 talking about our speech and what's on our lips. Always rejoice, constantly pray. Verse 17, constantly pray. There's something about a tool here he's naming in our daily life, a state of mind. Constantly pray and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all that you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. Constantly pray. Let's pray now. Lord, thank you for what you're doing at Pilgrim Church, and I am humbled to serve these people that are yours. They are the sheep of your fold. I am an under-shepherd. You are the great I am, the living shepherd, the great shepherd of all the sheep that we are under you. And so, God, take these words today and use them as only you can. For I cannot change hearts that are soft nor stubborn. I can't do this by sheer power of words. As Paul said, I didn't come to you in eloquent words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power. I pray that as the preaching goes forth, this foolish ancient act, that the demonstration of power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit would fall on this room, on each person here, and that we would be awakened out of our numbness, that the culture and kingdom of the world says there's only one way of being human, but you say there is another way. Let us be awake to that today in Jesus' name. And if you're willing to say amen, please be seated today as we move forward. So we've been talking about the gospel. And before you go today, I have a handout for you that I want you to grab in the back. I just have them up here. I'm not going to pass them out right now. But I do have another two I will give you towards the end of the sermon. But this bad boy you want to get. It's a nice summary of the story of the Bible of Israel And then also how Jesus, then the story of Jesus comes into that and what the gospel is. Uh, And so I want you to take that. It's by Scott McKnight, who we've been using liberally in this series. So take this before you go this morning. Uh, We'll have them in the back and some up here as well. So how do we become a church that is more focused on this gospel culture? This gospel meaning the story of Jesus. As I have said, I've been shaped somewhat by churches that focus on getting people to make a decision for Christ say yes to Jesus, but sometimes have forgotten that it was the Jesus himself, the story of Christ that summoned people to say, what must I do to become a Christian, to become saved in the book of Acts and throughout New Testament? So how do we create that culture that gets away from sort of get people to make a decision? And if we're going to be honest, most of us who follow Christ have given up on that. Most of us don't even look at these sort of old school evangelism tools. They used to be things like the Romans road, walk people through these verses in the book of Romans, and then they'll get them to say yes or get them to pray a prayer. Most of us have given up on evangelism. And I think part of it's because our culture shifted. We're in a post-Christian culture and people have judged the church and the gospel is bad news. 
And a lot because the church has been bad news. We've come across as hateful. We've come across as arrogant. We've come across as prideful. We've come across as everything that Jesus wasn't in his life and teachings. And so somehow we have to, in our church, create a culture where we fall in love again with the story and the teachings and the life of Jesus. We have to get that re-ingrained in us and find practices that do that. So what are some of the things we need to do? The first thing of these five, before we end with the tools this morning, so there's two parts of the sermon, five things, and then three tools, and the tools will go quickly. So hang with me this morning. By the way, if you're struggling this morning and you're dealing with inner emotions, I want to give you something from the Midwestern United States, from the northern plains and prairies, and from Minnesota. This is a very Minnesota mug this morning. It just says, be nice, okay? Look at your neighbor and say, be nice. Okay, I know which one of you need to practice this more. Look at your neighbor and say, be nice. (laughs) Be nice. The Upper Midwest prepared me for passive-aggressive Canadianism, by the way. We have have lots of similarities in our culture and Mennonite land, too. We are like the experts on passive-aggressiveness. There's real peace. There's peace faking, and then there's peacemaking. We don't want to be peace fakers. We want to be peacemakers, telling truth in love. So the first thing I would say, if you're following along in your outline, is that we need to become a people of the story. Say it with me, the story. What a story are we talking about? We're talking about the story of Israel. We're talking about the story of Israel coming to resolution or to fullness in the story of Jesus. Now, God still has a plan, I believe, do it with ethnic Israel, but in Jesus, he's expanded this, and Paul wrestles with this, and the book of Hebrews wrestles with this. But we need to immerse ourselves in understanding the Old Testament. The story of Israel, the story of the Bible is the story of Israel. And how God used this little people to do and reveal so much. And through their sinfulness and brokenness, not just exalts and good things, but also all of the broken, in fact. And that's, we learn from Old Testament. I was delighted in the church I grew up with. We often talked about the ABCs of salvation or, or the Romans road or the bridge to salvation, all of these sort of get to the salvation piece. We came through the back road. We came back to the story. We still taught the stories. And so even though we focused on this sort of salvation oriented piece and we confused what the gospel is, we still got it sort of unintentionally by all the other stuff. Knowing the story, knowing what happened and had the big scope and sweep of the Old Testament, the story of the Bible is important for shaping us because we are to find ourselves and our struggles and our lives in what is going on in this people that God called out and used. These stories can teach us and draw us in. But of course, we don't end it there. We read it through the lens of Jesus then because Jesus has come as the fullness of God until the end of creation. We read it through that. But we can enter in these stories. We need to become people of the story and let that become your story. I think in some traditions of pieces of the ancient story of Israel, for example, one of the biggest stories is the story of the Exodus. If you don't know the story of the Exodus, part of your discipleship is learning to read the Bible and hear these stories uh, throughout what's going on. The Exodus of how God had a people and these people were delivered by immigrating into a foreign nation, but eventually that foreign nation becomes a place of bondage and dominance and even slavery for them. And they uh, had turned their backs, some of them on the Lord, but others called out to the Lord to deliver them. And of course, the story within the story of the Bible, the story of Israel, God sends a deliverer. He raises up leadership in Moses. And Moses says, I don't want to be a leader. And God gives him more people and builds a team. And eventually, these people are set free and brought out. This story of God's deliverance of our lives when the odds are overwhelming, when everything is pressing against us, when the kingdom and the empire and the culture of the world or our families of origin seem so overwhelming and crushing, there is this story that Yahweh breaks in and wants to bring us new life. These stories shape us and form us. The story of the Exodus, we need to enter into that as followers of Jesus. And Jesus, of course, in the New Testament becomes sort of the Moses for all of us. And expands this liberating power of God's kingdom. So first of all, we need to become people of the story. Would you say the story with me one more time? The story. Know the story. Be shaped by it. It gives you pushback against the totalizing claims of all that around us. The liturgies of our nation, of the empire, of the broken parts. The second thing, of course, is building on that story is the story of Jesus. That we immerse ourselves, number two, in the story of Jesus, the story that is complete in Jesus, that the first three-fourths of this book 
are pointing somewhere to God breaking in personally in Christ. The story that is complete in Jesus, soaking in Jesus, soaking in his teachings, reading, pondering, digesting, mulling over in our heads and hearts the four Gospels. And I would say if there's a peak in the Bible, it's the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Once you get past the birth story of Jesus, those first few chapters, that we should know the words of Jesus as followers of Jesus, what Jesus said, what Jesus did, how Jesus acted, how he responded to religion, how he responded to power, how he, how he spoke and how he even modified the Old Testament law. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, do good to those who persecute you, bless them. You have, said, do, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, even holding anger in your heart is like murder. He calls us to be transformed by his teachings, by his spirit living within us. So soaking in the story of Israel leads us to understanding the story of Jesus. The story of Old Testament is the back story for the story of Jesus. Does that make sense? Am I making this? I mean, I can drill this down even more simpler if we need to. I don't, I, not much, but that's, that's pretty straightforward stuff there. There's an example of knowing the backstory, the story of Israel and the story of Jesus. You know, when authors write books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, or articles, even short articles, they often give you the backstory, or they give you enough of what happened before so you can kind of track with what's going on in what they're writing now. They always give a backstory. I think of the huge writings of like J.R.R. Tolkien and his, uh, his son had passed away, I think it was last week, who also brought more of his writings to us. Uh, but in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, or if you watch the movies, there's a lot of time spent on building backstory in those movies. In the Hobbit movies, there's a lot of backstory that we keep getting so we understand bit by bit what's going on in the present in that timeline within the movie. So the temptation of is Jesus in the wilderness, for example, if we know the Old Testament, is not just about him overcoming temptation. He certainly does that, but it's about him being in place of all humanity, doing what Adam and Eve couldn't do in the garden with the serpent when the enemy came to tempt them. Now, Jesus, in the story of the temptation, he overcomes this. He faces down the enemy again, and he uses Scripture, what would have been just the Old Testament at that point, to do that. So if we understand the story, we see there's something bigger going on in the life of Jesus than just his life. His life is making claims on all humanity, backward and forward in time. Say a little more about number two, the story of Jesus. How can we, give us a tool, pastor. Give me a tool. I'll give you a tool. Come here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my bags are packed. Um, one tool we use in our church and we've introduced, and it's an old tool, it's not unique to us, is the church calendar. Many of us, if you can't save the evangelicalism as I did, we only did Christmas and Easter. We didn't even do, well, we eventually did Good Friday, but we did pretty much Christmas and Easter. But all through the church year, there's a pattern. There's a year how we can, we talked about Lunar New Year and we talked about Calendar New Year, but before that we talked about the church New Year, that we can use our calendar to mark time through the story of the life of Jesus and then his teachings during summer all through the year as we follow this church calendar. And we can, of course, keep our secular time calendar or whatever our cultural calendars are, but we also remember this church calendar can shape us in the story of Jesus. How do we immerse ourselves in the story of Jesus? Read the Bible. Yes, yes, yes. But do things like understand the church year where we read certain readings and we celebrate certain things in Jesus' life and then we celebrate his death and resurrection. Each year we go through that. This will shape you, inform you, and give you a pushback against the liturgies of the world around you. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, after Epiphany, Lent, the great three days that lead to Easter and the Easter Vigil and Resurrection Day and Pentecost and then the time of summer, which is growth time or ordinary time. So we want to do this as we devote our lives to Jesus. You've got to let Jesus fire your imagination. You've got to let Jesus get under your skin through the scriptures and you will become a person of the gospel. Quickly, the last three in this list. Number three is the church's story. So we want to understand the church's story, the story of Israel, the story of the Bible, the story of Jesus, and then the church's story. Understand how the apostles, the first followers of Jesus, took the story of Israel and then the story of Jesus into the next generations. And that's the church's story. That's our story. We are a continuation. Acts sort of leaves dangling at the book of Acts that implies that now you go and take this story onward. 
In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is given and they are filled and empowered by the Spirit with holy boldness to share this message of Jesus, Paul, uh, Peter preaches and he says that this promise of the Spirit of Christ is for you and for all who are a far off, meaning all of us that respond to the summons of God going forward until he comes again. We as the church are being woven into the story of Israel and the story of Jesus, and we are a continuation of that empowering presence that says there's another way to be human, not based on wall building and tribalism and division, but based on outrageous love of God displayed in Christ. We are part of that story. When we follow Jesus, we are baptized into community, into a local church. Somebody ought to say amen. It's good stuff. Don't make me get down there and start yelling at myself. It would be awkward. Very awkward. Be nice too, all right? So the story continues in the church. What is one way the church has helped remember the story of Jesus in a nutshell? Another tool this morning, and I'm going to pass these back. If you haven't already taken one in the last few weeks, would you mind? Just let them slowly make their way through the... uh, through the crowd here, is something called the creeds or the Nicene Creed. And this is one of the tools that we'll finish up talking about today. But there's creeds that were developed out of the rule of faith that were used early in baptism, even as the New Testament was being formed and written down. And the Nicene Creed later is developed as sort of a summation of the story of the church and Jesus in a nutshell. This is a tool to use, to even memorize. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. All those were dealing with heresies and controversies that came into the church mainly through a sort of Gnostic religion. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. The story in a nutshell, you should have this internalized one way or the other. This is modern English translation of it from a liturgical commission, the story of Jesus, the church's story. Know the creeds that can shape you and form you. In fact, sometimes when I'm praying or even coming up here praying, leading worship, because I've internalized this, it will pop into my brain just like some pieces of scripture and it helps shape me and gives me pushback. When I'm upset about what's going on in the politics of the world, when the kingdoms of the world are acting unjustly and trying to crush the church, I am reminded of the words taken again from scripture and the early church. He will come again. He will come again. Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living, ultimate justice to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. President Trump's kingdom will have an end. Somebody should say amen. Okay. I'm in Canada. I can say this, right? Don't put this online, Spencer. Delete this. (laughs) Uh, The rule of Chairman Xi will come to an end. I I know I can't travel to China now, but I just said it. It will come to an end. It will come to an end. The rule of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will come to an end. Queen Elizabeth will die and all of that one day will come to There is only one true king and his kingdom is a different kind of kingdom. And it's worth giving all of your life for the story of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the reign of Christ. So four and five quickly this morning. Again, borrowing from Knight McKnight. We need to learn to develop counter stories. Say it with me, counter stories, counter stories. One more time, counter stories, one, two, three. (laughs) Stories, that was brilliant, wonderful, wow. We need to develop stories that, that counter the secular liturgies that are surrounding us all the time. To quote McKnight directly, our culture offers us a myriad of many, many, many false stories rooted in superficial worldviews. And these stories, more often than not, refuse entrance to the gospel story, and they, or they want to reshape the gospel story, either overtly or destroy it. Like I say, kingdoms of the world want to either crush or co-opt Jesus. McKnight says this, but a gospel culture can resist those stories by announcing the gospel story as the ultimate one true story. So we need practices, my dear friends, that give us pushback against the anti-gospel stories of our culture. And what are some of these stories that are trying to grasp onto us today? Some of them are things like individualism, that I am the greatest good and that I am God and everything, that, that I am the center of everything. Some of them are consumerism, you are what you buy, you are what you can consume. 
We think of how the Christian holiday of Christmas has become riven with consumerism. We come across Lunar New Year's and it's very easy to see how that uh, money focus can be riven by consumerism that you are what you buy and if you don't have the means or you don't have enough money or you're, or you're unable to gift at a certain level, your worth is diminished. That is ultimately a false story of who you ultimately are in Christ. You are beloved of God. You are a son and daughter of the King. You are made to be an image bearer, an icon of the living God who is made fully known in Jesus. What about another one? What are some of the stories that we have to continually let the gospel help us have pushback against? Nationalism. Oh, Canada, my home and adopted land. True or God bless uh, nationalism. Is my first identity in my tribe of my nation. Now, there's something good about nations when they're in their proper place. But there's something demonic when they become divisive, hateful uh, Uh, This sort of thing that drives us. I could say more about that one, but I'll stop. I'll give you a few more stories that we have to develop pushback against. Scientism turning the pursuit of truth into a religion. Pop atheism does this. Sort of new age. Everything is all in all and it's all, we're all just emanations of one another. We're all just inter, we're all just one blob. Versus there is a good side of individualism that we are persons known in community. Postmodern tribalism, our ethnic or ideological groupthink. And we all have this in spades. And one last one is, and I believe in therapy, but if we forget that salvation is not by therapy, it is ultimately in the claims of who God says our true identity in Christ. And therapy helps us when we need those helps to maybe get reoriented around that. But that sort of that sin management is not the gospel. So let me give you two more tools, and then we land this with number five in the summary. There's communal practices that we do as a church, as a community, baptism and communion. Jesus gave us physical, visceral tools that help shape us. Next Sunday, we'll have communion, and one of our seminary students will preach. So you get a break from me, and then I'm going to talk about the power of the tongue, preach to myself and all the rest of us, go go visit James. We're going to have a good time in February. But on the first Sunday, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. I think eventually you may have a station if we remodel the room where you could receive communion if you want every Sunday, but we're thinking about it. But this idea of the Lord's table that we come and we celebrate, we remember our baptism, we remember Christ's death and resurrection, we believe that he will come again, and we do this as a tactile ritual, something that shapes us at a deeper level. These are practices that help us to be shaped by the story and to remember and have pushback against the stories of the culture. These are our counter stories. Say, well, tell me more about the table. You know, Jesus, again, becomes the Passover, takes the Passover of Israel, and now he becomes the lamb for all time. He takes on and absorbs the sin. There's many different ways to understand that, but I just want to leave you with this main idea that at his table in the church, all are welcome to receive his saving blood and his grace to experience new life. That this is a table that represents an open table that we come to him and we are changed by him. It's a competing story to to the stories of closed tables of all of our world around us. It is the family which anyone can be adopted into, can be born into by the power of the spirit. It is the table that welcomes all. Okay, last one. You with me? Say amen. Amen. See, I'll get you out here. Don't worry. We'll get you out in three minutes. No, that's a lie. Oh, let's say five. Okay. Embrace the story personally. Say it with me. Embrace it personally. Embrace it for yourself. So that you can be saved and transformed. Salvation comes out of this. Justification by faith. All of this as we embrace and we respond. As we respond to the summons of the Spirit through the gospel story. Then we enter into salvation. And it's not just a check it box off that I said the prayer. I admitted that Jesus, that I'm a sinner. I believe that he's Lord and I I believe that he's real and and he's living and he confessed him as Lord and that's it. Churches that just focus on the ABCs have a problem of people becoming Christians. And some of us have said that prayer of some type over and over again, but we have not followed Jesus. And he said, there'll be many that said, well, I did this and that, or I said this or that. He said, but he said, depart from me. I never knew you because they weren't disciples. If we don't get grounded in the story, we will not create deep uh, people who are following Christ in real life. It is important that we follow Jesus. The gospel story summons us to salvation and then to follow and live into that story of his life, teachings, death, and resurrection. 
We need to move beyond that. Why do so many fall away in superficial Christianity? Because they were told that they just needed to sign the gym membership, say the ABCs. They were never told. It is about letting your life be caught up into the story of Jesus because we didn't preach it and we didn't live it and we didn't work for justice in the kingdom and we forgot about these works. But these are the things that summon people to receive the fullness of the grace that empowers them a different kind of life of holiness and life change and transformation. There's a lot we can say about that, but I'll land that one. We need to be fully converted ourselves. We need to buy into what we have recorded in the scriptures from Jesus, Paul, and Peter, and Mary, I just had to say that, and their testimony of Jesus, their gospel vision. To believe, to repent, to be baptized in the name of God who is relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working at us to respond. Oh, I got to land this. So we embrace this story through means of prayer and through repetition. So what are some simple tools that we can use in our daily lives to remind ourselves of this story? Read this thing before you sometime this week. But we need to understand that within Judaism and within early Christianity, there were things that were used, like this Nicene Creed, for example, to help remind us of the story. There was the Jesus Creed, and the Jesus Creed was the Shema, and Jesus alters this from Judaism, and he gives us something else. He says, as we read again in Mark, this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he adds Leviticus 19, 18, and the second is like this, Love the neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. McKnight challenges us to begin and end each day with this, and the Jesus Creed is at the top of this card. I want to invite you right now to grab this. Hopefully everyone has one now. And I would like us to say this together as we move towards the close of our service. This is one practical tool to continue to focus on the story of Jesus. Would you join with me? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than than these. Love of God, love of neighbor, the core of our creed of following Jesus. And there's one other prayer I want to leave you with today. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, it's called the Jesus Prayer. And the Jesus Prayer is just one sentence. And how this is used is this First Thessalonians command to pray unceasingly is to have this sort of running in the back of your mind. Some even use little prayer uh, beads or necklace or whatever. But it's a very simple prayer, and I like it because us in the evangelical world won't freak out because they're not pulling on the Theotokos. They're not pulling on all the saints and all that. It just keeps it on Jesus. We can agree on that. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this is pulling from several pieces of Scripture. Peter's confession, you are the Messiah, the Lord. And Jesus says to Peter, on this rock, this confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Lord Jesus ultimate ruler of all, coming again, power under, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, fully human, fully divine, have mercy on me. Pulls from the parable in the New Testament where Jesus talks about two guys going to church. It's a temple, but two guys going to church. And the one guy says, oh Lord, thank you that I'm not like this lowly sinner over here. I'm so good, Lord. I'm so, aren't you so blessed by my presence today, Father in heaven? And then the lowly sinner is praying, Lord God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He says, which one do you think went home justified, Jesus says to those listening. Well, obviously, not the guy full of pride and has, has, has it all together because he hasn't realized his own brokenness. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. A sinner is a good mantra to remind us of what Jesus is doing now in our personal lives and in our community. Thomas Sword says this, to love, as we said, love the Lord your God. To love is to act intentionally in sympathy or empathy in response to God and to those in your life to promote overall goodness, flourishing, or well-being. So let me land this plane. You can stand with me because I really mean it. Look at that. Oh, I did it in five. Yay, me. <laughs> Invite our worship team to come up too. They'll sing us out today. After we're done, if you need prayer, by the way, find me. Find one of our elders. Um, David, Lou, and Donna. I see David. I think Donna's there too. Oh, yes, there she is. Andre, uh, Andre and Barb, myself, anybody. And we'll pray with you as well for anything, really. 
But I want to leave you with this. In January, the goal is to focus again on the center of what it's all about, and it's all about Jesus. Would you say it with me, Jesus? It's all about Jesus. I want to challenge you. Your next steps today are these, to, to, to make a commitment to learn more this year, and maybe not all of these things, but maybe just one of these things, but learn about the history of the church and the churches, to dig more into Scripture, to find a pattern of reading Scripture, the story of God, the story of the Bible, and the story of Israel, the story of Jesus, and then the story of the church, those three big things that are being revealed in Scripture. And again, don't be under guilt or shame But there's so many other liturgies forming you. If you don't make it intentional, the other liturgies will form you. Individualism, consumerism, nationalism, all those things that we named and more. The second next step today would be a commitment to naming the idols in our lives and in our world. And develop some counter stories. Your identity is not in how much money you gave or couldn't give to somebody in the last 24 hours. But if you got a lot of extra money left over and you want to put it in a red envelope and give it to me or Pilgrim, we'd take it. But I'm just saying, your core identity, your core identity is not that. Your core identity is not consumption as we, Christmas has been often hijacked by the counter stories of a culture. We need to develop those counter stories to name idols in our lives. And the one other summary takeout or next steps is to develop the use of tools that help bring you back out of the lies of the culture and consumption and my worth is what I do or my worth is my education or my worth is where I live or my worth is my ethnic tribe or my worth is my whatever, whatever, whatever. These tools, the Jesus Creed, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all that you are. Those four words are just simply mean inclusive of everything. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. In the morning and in the evening, I invite you, use the tool, use the Jesus prayer throughout your day. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Use these to pull you out, to recenter, and then go back into life a little different. And maybe the tool of the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. I like the Nicene Creed a little better because it covers a little more. But this idea of these things shape us and form us. Use these tools. They are the right tools for the job. In addition to extemporaneous or prayers off the top of your brain, use these other things too. They will shape and form you. Let's pray and get on to the rest of the week. Lord, thank you for what you're doing at Pilgrim. Thank you that you are doing new life where there was death. That where there was bondage, you are bringing freedom. Thank you that you speak to our soul that, yes, we want to prosper because all of our cultures value that, but you care that, in fact, that prosperity will leave us empty unless our soul prospers in you. And so, God, we want to experience that. And, Lord, help us to engage with the tools that you've given us through the grace and all of the means of grace that we can access through the word and through the community of faith and in our individual lives. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. Let them know that they are loved by you And that is the deepest truth that goes all the way down. From creation, they were made to be co-regents and reign under your authority as you as the ultimate king of all. So, Lord, we submit to you today. You are the Lord of all, Jesus. Amen.